Today is Wednesday, January 18th, 2023, and we are at the Bronx County Historical Society Research Center at 3313 Bainbridge Avenue, the Bronx. I am Pastor Crespo Jr., the research librarian and archivist, and I am joined for part two of an oral history for the Bronx Aerosol Arts Documentary Project with Sen1, IBM, also known as George Morillo, a legend within the graffiti community and an original member of the incredible Bombing Masters, IBM. His art has transitioned from New York City subway tunnels and yards to sharing fine art gallery space alongside renowned international artists such as Pablo Picasso. Sen1 has even received a commission from the Michelle Obama Foundation. Good afternoon, Sen. How are you? Good afternoon. Nice to meet you. Can I, can I just make a correction on the foundation, Michelle Obama Foundation? It was actually through, it was a non-for-profit called um, Dougie Fresh's non-for-profit, um, and it was through her Let's Move organization. So it was like this whole White House event. So Got I just it. wanted to clear that up. A of bit. course, but that's please. what it was. It was commissioned through Hip Hop USA and an umbrella of different organization, mm -hmm. grassroots organization. So I just wanted to just just define that a little bit. <laughs> Great. And I read on the uh, Gallery Dorsey website that you identify as Afro-Caribbean. Yes. Could you talk about a little about how you identify and where your parents are from? Definitely. Um, so. My situation is a little unique on uh, knowing my history, uh, my family. I'm from Quisqueya, Haiti, which is Dominican Republic in Haiti. And um, we go back because the Murillo, if you look up the Murillo family, we, um, we, um, we incorporate the military for like, who knows, like a hundred, over a hundred, probably about a hundred years um, of the island's history. And um, as a militia first, and then as, as the military. Um, down to, from my grandfather down to all my uncles and now my cousins are in the military as well. But um, so we incorporate this history and then the Afro-Caribbean thing is because if you know your culture and you know your history of the Caribbean, you know that um, the slave trade of America was the slave tri triangle, which the slaves were brought in from Africa, were brought in, transferred into the Caribbean prior to coming to the Americas. So you have the slave triangle and then back to Africa. So the ship routes. So the Caribbean is highly influenced by our original Arawak people, which people like to say Tainos and different tribes, Sibone and all these other tribes. But when it comes down to the bloodline, our bloodline runs through South America, Central America and, and so on. And, and Africa, of course, and being that, you know, melanated people originate from where Africa. So also in my blood trait, I have the sickle cell anemia trait, which also, so I might be a little light skin. Actually, my mother breeded me and my brother lighter because of what she experienced here. So that's some of the stuff that our people also psychologically had to go through where um, our parents had to make choices sometimes of aborting the darker skin children and keeping the lighter skin. So me and my brother have a seven year um, gap in between us. And um, so, yeah, so the Afro comes, she always kept kept me um kept us um educated again because of the family tree and how far back we could trace our roots um to our, our melanated um peoples and also um we still practice the Eligua stuff and and um she will always travel to haiti so it was never a separation um when it came to me growing up of understanding my um, melanated side of it so that's the afro-caribbean you know <laughs> So what neighborhood did you grow up in? I grew up in what's like the borderline of what would be the beginning of what Harlem is. But it was like, even though a lot of people consider 110th Street being Harlem, but my area like 96th Street and Broadway was the mecca for Afro-Latin jazz growing up. So pretty much I'm on, I'm on, I'm on 90, I was born on 95th and 94th Street in Amsterdam. I was living in tenement there. Then I would move up to 93rd Street in Columbus. But that area was always under what they would call um, urban development. So we went through the burnt down stuff like the Bronx did, obviously. Um, that was a way of, of, of clearing out areas um, and taking also prop. People don't understand that when the New York was burning down in the 70s, it was, it was part of a bigger plan, which was um, 
it was a way of taking property away from people of color mainly and transforming areas to like projects, creating more projects and creating buildings that were like under like a program like Mishalama and these different programs. And what they did was through urban development um, and in a, in a intimate domain, they would take people's properties and when the, so what landlords would burn down half the streets, the slumlords and cahoots with the system. And then there'll be one or two buildings left or small how you know, buildings left from that people of color might own or poor whites, you could say white people. And um, what the city would do then use that as a pretense to say, well, we're gonna take over that entire block and build this 30 floor building in which we're gonna make it affordable housing. So my neighborhood was like the beginning of this um, transformation for the entire city. And so growing up in that, I went from literally one extreme to the other, from a tenement, 94th street, um, to being able to move up to Columbus on 83rd Street to a 30 floor um, high rise, which was a community in itself. I mean, you had thousands of people living in this building, um, no security, no nothing. And we just had to regulate. But that's what made the neighborhood really unique because it became really diverse because as that shift is happening, you have a lot of the original people that live there, but then you have a lot of people coming from the South, the Caribbean, from different parts, um, South America. So we all being like blended in. And then you, of course you have the Irish, the Italians that were there, the Jewish community that were there. So you have this nice big blend in that neighborhood. So basically that's the neighborhood I grew up in. And then, like I said, we're right there um, to Harlem. Um, we're an extension actually to us, to Harlem. And then on 135th Street, you got the bridge that leads to the South Bronx. So you basically are like, right in the middle and then again then going down going south then you have what Lincoln Center we know the history that happened there with what happened to the little village of the Puerto Rican community that was there that ended up getting eliminated for Lincoln Center and those projects Anson projects that were put there same thing that happened to us and then we could go further down to like Times Square 42nd so my neighborhood was kind of unique because we're like right in the middle and then Central Park is there across the east side. So you basically are like um, right in the middle. The That's probably why it's the hottest. Right now it's classified as the hottest, hottest neighborhood in the city to live in. You know, So I'm from there. OK. <laughs> Making right. it short, I'm from there. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk about your association with La West Side Familia? How did that begin in your various roles and involvement with them? Um, absolutely. That's a major part of my life it's from from youth to, to now, to this day. So La West Side Familia, just to give a quick breakdown, it's it comes, it's an outlaw gang. It's an era of New York City when outlaw gangs, every community had an outlaw gang. So like up here, you have like everything from the Savage Skulls, the Chingalings, and on and on. I mean, the entire city was de de um, carved out in sections originally. And, and the reason this happened is that originally, as people of color, migrated in a lot of these communities, they were not received proper. They were, re they were, it was really hostile, whether it was an Italian community or Jewish community, whatever it was, they didn't want, they didn't want us there. So gangs became, you could see like West Side stories, you know, the cavemen, there's tons of stories based on this. Um, so what happens is that we end up, our communities end up having to build gangs that were like organizations in order for protection. So one of the biggest gangs, of course, is Black Spades, which become Zulu Nation, which is influential for hip hop. So West Side Familia, the original Familia is out of Brooklyn. Brooklyn had tons of um, outlaw, every every part of the city had outlaw gangs. Um, and Brook, so La West Side, so La Familia is the original is from Brooklyn. In 1974, so this Chino, who's Robert Perez, who's the founder of La West Side Familia, he grew up with the Young Lords. He grew up, he grew up amongst the outlaw gangs and very young, he was already made into these gangs. Um, he's Boricua, so he was into the, he was into the whole, a lot of these gangs, that's what was dominated. And um, so anyway, in 1974, in our neighborhood, he creates what's La West Side Familia. So we're the younger, we're the younger organization of La Familia from Brooklyn. So that, we consider that our oldest, our older brother crew, club, um, older brother club. That's how it's like, so we connected but then we're not. So in a way we govern ourselves, but when fast forward into the future, when I'm around and there's ever needed more backup, then they will roll up from Brooklyn and handle stuff. And they were like, 
older cats, outlaws, they like Hell's Angels. So when they came, they came in a flurry. It was no joke. Like you called them up. That's like that's like pressing the red button, the nuclear bomb. That's why when things are too out of control, we can't handle it. That phone call is made and they just come and sweep everything and they don't they don't they don't ask questions. They just go and demolish anybody in the area that they need to run through and nobody knows who they are. So they'll come out of like out of nowhere and just devastate. We had we had to do that maybe once or twice in our neighborhood, but most of the time we had our own. So from nineteen seventy four, obviously I wasn't a part of that. I would have been six years old, five, six years old. They dominated um from ninety sixth Street to about I would say maybe eighty six. There was other clubs in between, like the little mosquitoes and but they were too small. Familia was always powerful. It was always big. It dominated. It had a lot it didn't have a lot of members because um, the way it worked back then, it was like your community was basically your membership was your extended family, but then there'll be a core that are actually the members. So it's like a mafia. So you work your way in or you're born in, like your older brothers or siblings are part of it. So you automatically inherit that. I moved up to the block from Amsterdam. Amsterdam Avenue had the Sandmans, which was an older gang, which was also connected to Familia's beginnings. But then later on, crews developed like the boys, homeboys only. And they came out of these projects mm -hmm. on Amsterdam. We didn't they didn't necessarily didn't get along with La Familia in Columbus. So by the time I move up to Columbus, just moving up one avenue was now entering a whole different world. It was like now this is all one gang territory and they dominated it. But once I moved up there, um, my mother was really being a single mom's with two boys and my brother was kind of like more uptown with my aunt. Um, she felt, you know, she was always tough and always felt vulnerable, like having to protect us. Um, when we moved up the block, unlike the Sandmans, which were really hostile, Familia was more welcoming. So she would go to the supermarket and Chino and them be on the corner on 93rd and they would help with her groceries and stuff. And so she, she felt home automatically, which then made me feel at home. Um, because of her kind of feeling a little better than living down the block. She felt safer with this gang. Um, automatically, I was then attracted more, felt comfortable, you could say. Instead of feeling like I have to be afraid of this, I felt more like our neighborhood was safer up here because you had this gang. So anyway, just laying down from my experience as a young kid, that's where my guards kind of like went down and I kind of like started admiring them as a as a as a gang versus being afraid of them it was more like you know not having a father figure really you start to then look up like oh man this is cool i like the way they would do block cleanups on saturdays but then they were also highly respected and fear like like there was no joke so as a young man um without that male guidance seeing that and being around that was a good role model for me um to see even though it's a gangs and they did their things, they were stabbed and fighting through, but it was their day to day conduct that, you know, gave me the vision of what a man should be, especially a person that protects his community. And um so growing up in that neighborhood, um, I, I, I got closer to the younger kids that were my age that were inherited into the gang by their older siblings. And little by little, um, that's who I ran with. And that kinda like where the transition of the graffiti went into early on, probably about, I was already, because you grow up there, you're already doing the stuff with them and you're growing up. So it was easy for also you to, to get jumped because you also affiliated, you're from that neighborhood. So automatically you go somewhere and even if you're not down with Familia, you're gonna get your ass whipped as a, because you already identified as being part of that. So just little by little, it just, it was both, it was me being you know, wanting to be a part of it, but also having not a choice. Like you go somewhere, you're already identified as being that. So, and I got jumped a lot and I, I paid my dues. And so that's the beginning of that, how I got introduced to it. And then um, as I got older, like I said, the graffiti thing, they were at constant war with 105th Street and the extension of what is called the Ball Busters, which would become the biggest gang in the city, which was a migration of Dominicans that came into 135th and that whole area. 
and they end up taking over the entire drug trade and stuff. But they became the biggest dominant gang in the city that everybody from Zulu Nation to the to everybody had beef with. Like, and they would roll in hundreds. <laughs> like, we were small compared to them. So little by little, um, yeah, I earned my I earned my dues, and by probably fifteen, sixteen, um, um, although I was considered a member, I wasn't officially a member. So it came with its it came with it came with its 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 it's good and bad because I I could roll with the younger dudes and we could get into stuff, but when it came to like having full back, like some of the older dudes wouldn't have my back because I wasn't really a made man yet as it's classified. Um, that would come later. But I, I literally got a contract put on my life um, and a beef at 15 years old and actually had some of the older family members turn their backs. Actually, they got the phone call and they were told, because I spit, it was Yepes, this famous drug dealer. Me and him had beef and um, he was from the other side and I ended up getting into it with him on a train by Brandeis. They dominated Brandeis High School. And um, I ended up spitting him in his face through the through the train window, which if anybody grew up in that era, that's a death wish. Like you couldn't do that. That's like the ultimate disrespect. So he made a phone call that night and, and laid it down to them, like, yo, he crossed the line. I gotta handle this. And they basically was like, yo, that's between you and him. That's the way it's gonna be. You do what you gotta do with him. Because we also had rules on the streets and being young. You cross those rules thinking that, you know, you don't understand that it's, it's serious business. You think it's a game and it's easy for you to get caught up and thinking you could do whatever you want and there'll be consequences. And and your own crew, if you cross the line, would have to step back on principles and be like, you got to handle that now. We don't got your back. So that was one of my early experiences of of the seriousness of, of how this life could go and also how the rules uh, respect it across the board. It didn't matter if it was your enemies. It was like at those times, not today, but we had um, the streets had, had guidelines and rules. And if you broke them, your own family could turn their back and say, hey, you know, we ain't gonna, we ain't gonna, we ain't gonna back you up on that. You knew you shouldn't do shit like that. That's it, you know? So um, that was my early experiences. And then eventually I would um, gain rank um, a lot of it came after Chino killed one of the members and that changed, escalated. Once once, once a killing happens within gang life, um, it elevates. Prior to that, it's all fun and games. It's jumping, stabbings, and cuttings, and, and beefing, and going to parties, and jumping each other, and hitting each other with bricks and bats. All that's considered fun when you're young. But once somebody gets killed, um, and I think that's the same as today, um, it changes. It, everything changes. Now it's no longer it's no longer those type of child childish games where you're gonna beat each other up. Now it's people out to revenge and they only want to kill. It becomes it changes the old aspect. So my my change in farming that was that Chino ended up killing um this kid from 105th and he went to jail for that and Chino being the leader. When that happened all hell broke loose all the parents of the older kids got afraid and basically shipped all. So we had these different tiers from 1974. So you have the original Familia Pacino. Then you had another tier under them. Then you had the older brothers from the friends that I ran with. They were, and it got, it went from being wild to, to a little calm. And then this group was wild. And then we was the young ones and we was ultimately wild. But the ones above us, they were the ones that were like no joke. And those are the ones that had us and teaching us. And we was under their wing and they would clash. But anyway, long story short, the majority of them got shipped out. Their parents sent them out, sent them everywhere. And it was left on a lot of us younger ones to stick around. We didn't have a choice. We didn't have a place to go. We didn't, we wasn't, we wasn't re re relocated like that. So then, but that also gave us the opportunity that because we was left behind, we had to deal with the beefs. And then it elevated us in also um, in our fighting. That's when I started working out, gained weight, got bigger. And we also got more vicious because we was left in that war without any real backup or leadership. And But then when everybody started coming back, because we held it down, um, we was now at a different level. We wasn't the little kids no more. Now we was 
we was compared to all of them. We was there. We was we was the generals and the, and um, we handled it. And that's that's my pro- my story. How I became a member because during that time is when I put in my work. Um, and by the time everything settled down, um, there was no denying me my membership or my entry or my commitment, my loyalty. And yeah, and then I would get arrested too on some that I do. So it's like Goodfellas. So it's just like Goodfellas. Familia and the two members went to jail for shooting somebody. And um, one was my best friend and his older brother, who was my mentor, and um, which was devastating at that time. And um, when that happened, um, the the tear from the older brothers, they began to look for it. Because at that time, there was no snitching on the streets. But we they went around looking for whoever was the one that ratted. That, that snitched throughout the city. So the, the way the streets worked back then, everything was rumors. You would hear networks, you would hear something from somebody from some neighborhood and they'll come back and it'll get back to somebody, whether it's through school or something. So everything was a network in the streets. And what would happen is that the the, the tier that was above us, because one of their main dudes, who was my mentor, went to jail. And the younger one that was with, with us, they went on a fury of looking for who's, who ratted, but also it was a way of intimidating a witness as well. So that's how that worked. But they went around beating up like five, six people and jumping on just off of rumors. Like names were popping up daily and they would just put on their mission. It was like guided missiles. It was like such and such. We heard such and such was the one that's the witness that told and they'll roll up on their schools, beat them up. So we had a jam in our neighborhood and this kid was there and he was all jewelryed up. He had, you know, his, his, his whole chubby kid. And I had nothing to do with it. And I was with my tier, my young crew, and the little older crew, all of a sudden, they jumped this dude because somebody, the rumors had got back that he was one of the dudes that was a witness or telling or whatever it was. And they ended up jumping him, which we didn't get involved with because when that tier got involved, they just steamrolled. But us as being the youngest, we didn't really get involved unless we really was pulled into it. But sometimes you just step back and just let them they had it under control. You didn't get it, you didn't get involved. And they went down like that that night. And um, they they fucked, they beat this dude up bad and they robbed him and did everything. And then ended up being his sister was in my class and Martin Luther King, and she was a good friend of mine. And when I went to school, she like flipped out on me. She couldn't believe that he got jumped. He should have been safe because of my and her relationship. I didn't even know that was her brother. I had nothing to do with it. Um, and anyway, long story short. Um, she flipped out on me, got upset, and a couple of days later, the cops were calling my house and telling my mother they wanted to question me. I didn't know anything about the sh- I had nothing to do with it. And then, but I went to the older guys and I'm like, yo, the detectives are calling me about this dude, this this shit that you know. And they were like, man, don't don't go, don't you know? This is the older guys telling me, don't don't answer no questions, don't go. And then, but of course, my mom's, I would go home and my mom's would be in tears. They were calling her constantly and threatening her that they were going to arrest me. And it was, anyway, long story short, she convinced me um, to go in and get questioned. I did. Again, I ended up, of course, you know, I stood shut, you know, like, I don't know what you're talking about, you know, plead the fifth. And I got, they promised my mom they wouldn't arrest me. And sure enough, they arrested me and they charged me with, um, Gang assault, then robbery, um, gang robbery, some shit like that. Anyway, I was young. I was like maybe 15, 16 years old. 16, because I ended up going to the bullpens mm-hmm. downtown, which was relevant to the Rikers Island in those days. But um, because I ended up going through that <laughs> and holding my, holding my own, again, the bullpens, you had to like, you had to be tough in those days. And actually funny, I, and I jumped in real quick. I'm sorry with this. But it was funny because this what? is, I used to look up to Click, who's K Slay, rest in peace, De- on Dez. At that time, as a young graffiti dude, prior to that, Dez was like an icon, a god. He's in the Graffiti Hall of Fame. He's somebody, you know, coming from IBM. These are the styles that we was into. So I end up legit, like, this is like officially meeting him was in the bullpens. <laughs> so, and it was funny because I'm sitting there, I'm young, right? And I'm at, and I'm tough. I'm going in there. I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm getting groomed for gang stuff. And I've already been through crews and all that. So I already know. I haven't been locked up, but I already know how you're supposed to behave from the older dudes. So the minute I get in there, it's like, you know, get off the, you know, pushing people off the benches, move, you know, like, and you housing them, but you're young. I'm young. I'm 16 years old, but, you know, 16 years old, but gang, you know what I mean? So, and there's a crack era 
Um, actually, it was like a free base era. And um, so I, I take my position and you sit there and you like watch. You're giving everybody attitude. You're in there, you're just watching everybody. You're letting everybody know that, you know, you're ready to fight and you're on point. And I see there's a, oh, there was always a fight and a scuffle going on. And there was no guards, no nothing. Back then, the bullpens was, that's why it was called the bullpens. It was like, you just left on your own to survive. And I see a ruckus going on and I'm eyeing it, right? And I'm looking at this shit and I'm looking at the dude and he's, he's, it's like, he's flipping out and beating up this dude and taking and robbing him. Give me your sneakers, you know, boom, boom. And when I'm looking, I'm like, oh shit, that's Dez, right? <laughs> but I think at that time he was, he was on drugs. See, he was looking a little, he was looking crazy. Um, so I'm looking, I'm like, yo, that's Dez. And the funny thing about this story is that I literally like got in that zone of like a fan and shit. So he's robbing this dude, run your shit. And I get up, boom. And I go, yo, Dez. <laughs> and he's like, and I'm like, he was like, what's up? And I'm like, send one IBM. <laughs> it's just so funny. Cause I was yet, I was in this situation of like a survival thing, but yet that child in me still came out and he was like, What's up? Give me five. And went back to and then went back to robbing the dude. I just turned around and I ended up sitting down. And that was like the highlight of being locked up. I was so I actually I was happy that I was in, in jail <laughs> in this situation because I ended up meeting like somebody I used to like be a fan of and look up to. And I know I remember sitting there and then you know the whole time I was always mad. I was mad. At that point I sat down there and I was like, I was like happy as shit. Like, Shit, I just in my mind, I just met Dez, man. Desi Dez, you know, and I'm sitting there. So that, but then, like, again, like Goodfellas, when I end up leaving, um, because I, I, I took the charge and I, and I, um, my mother ended up hiring a Dominican lawyer that she knew. So he ended up, of course, I ended up beating the case. At that time, people didn't have lawyers. But um, the moment I got out, that was like another strike for me with the gang because um, then it was like, like good fellas, like oh shit, you know you took the charge, yeah, you held them down, you didn't say nothing, you you know you took one for the team because it was serious charges, you know, like gang assault and and robbery was it carried some time. It wasn't like I was, you know, like it was some little misdemeanor, and it was like felonies at that time. And and anything that was gang, you know, you went into a foul, you know. And and later on, I did. I ended up having to go to this organization, I Cry in the City Round Table of Youth that was down by Chamber Street. And all the all the police records and all the school records you put in the gang folder file. That's why I couldn't go to Brandeis because they would have to put you. In, it's like prison. They would have to put you in schools where they knew you didn't have a conflict with another gang. So from that moment on, I was now in gang files. So anyway, I got into a whole no, please, <laughs> that's fine. So how and when did you transition out and why? Transition out of out, out of, of La, La West Side for me. Uh, no, I haven't. We you still, haven't? No, we're there for life. That's a life thing. And I'm one of the patch. Actually, um, I'm one of the ones that earned uh, tattoo. Not many have have it. So yeah, but um, no, I, I spent my whole life with it actually, and it's been to this day. I'm still. I speak to Chino probably every other day. Still my family. Um, most of the members that are still alive from my. I, we just had a funeral for one of the sisters about a month ago. So it's still. It's still going. It's a family forever, forever, ever, ever. <laughs> like okay. I said, it's like a mafia. It's like you, you in, you in. But that's why I was always kept as a close, small circle of of a brother sisterhood, because it's it's that type of commitment. Okay. Now, uh, an individual you know, well, how did you meet Cyril Innes, and what was your involvement, you know, with the Black Panthers over the years? Oh man, Cyril and it's, it's bullwhip, man. That, that that's I got goosebumps. Um um those are my I have many teachers. I've been blessed in my life. Um and cursed in a lot of ways because I've been put in situations in which even with La Familia, um and different things, even with the graffiti things and going further back, um I've come across many souls that have been amazing and that's probably why I'm still here. Even as a young kid, um not having a father figure, like I said, and being on the streets young, I've met people that have been killers. You know, you could consider them from the 70s, hitmen that probably consider serial killers. They're no longer with us. But they were the ones that would see me as a kid in the street and educated me and kept me and taught me things and told me things. And and that knowledge is something that I 
carry with me forever. And it's probably the reason why I'm alive through everything. Not probably, it's definitely the reason why I'm alive and also knowledgeable about the stuff that's around me. And so getting into that, the Black Panther, Cyril Innes is original Black Panther member and a Black Liberation Army member um, from the New York chapters. So he was he was in the front lines with Fanny Shakur and all that, that whole generation. Um, Tulu Shakur, um, 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 Joseph Jamal, and all these other dudes from Harlem, the Harlem chapters. And um, so Bullwhip, I'll call him Bullwhip if you guys don't mind. Not that's, how, that's how we always called him. He, he um, actually, um, um, in the 90s, I was making transitions out of the mu I was in the music business. I was having a child. I, I had my first child. I was trying to transition out of, I've always worked, so it kept me out of jail, um, worked in law firms. So every time I caught a case, I've always had a clean record because I always beat my cases. But then also, I always had a job. And I started as a law firm at 18 years old, Scad Narps which was the second largest law firm in the nation. So that gave me credibility. Like when I go to court, I'll be like the only out of 50 defendants, you come up and you're the only one without a record and you're the only one with a job. So you would get bailed. The other people wouldn't, they'll get sent. So that, that helped me along the way. And the reason I say this is just to, to paint the picture. So during that era, I was having my first child. I, I tried to venture into the music business, which was, which was a mess. Um, it was gangster, gangster, just like the streets. It was just worse because they smiled in your face while they stabbed you in your back. Um, so leaving that errors and trying to find a way out of the street life, because I knew that I was doomed, that it was only two, that I was, that I had outlived my nine lives, put it like that, by that point. Um, and then having a child and then getting married um, and living these different lifestyles, life styles wasn't gonna I wasn't gonna last I knew it was a miracle that I had made it that far so in that era Chino who's also if I'm even but like I said came out of the Young Lords he's also an activist and he's my big brother you know these are my brothers and he was involved with the embargo of Cuba like the whole thing he's connected to like the Cuban government like and all this stuff because the Young Lords and I wasn't involved in any of that stuff but my mother was an activist and because of that, I guess it runs in my blood, my family, um, military DR, but also had a cousin who was an activist who was killed out there in DR. But anyway, um, I guess it runs in my blood. But to get to, to this was that um, Chino ends up taking me to a, a protest, a Cuban embargo protest, and I, I, I went along. And then from now, I went to another one, 125th Street, and I see this guy. I had the music business I had read, Seize the Time, Bobby Seale's book. And I was like so open because um, it was like coming from a gang, powerful gang. I was like, damn, this is the stuff. If we could have transitioned to politics, man, because at one point we had so much juice in the, in the streets. It was like, damn, and we had a network. Like imagine, and I'm reading about the Panthers, and I'm like, and the Young Lords and stuff. And I'm like, damn, this is where we should have taken it and a hike because we had so much power, so many soldiers on the street. Like we could have, this is me thinking back then. So I got into it a little bit. And like I said, Chino was into it. So I ended up meeting this guy who had a t -sh uh, shirt on with Yui and Bobby on it, with the gun. And of course, at that time, I'm coming out of gang stuff. I'm into the guns, right? And um, and I remember saying to him, yo, you got that shirt from him. And he was like hesitant. He's like, oh, part of the newspaper committee, the Black Panther newspaper committee. He's like, Black Panther newspaper, I thought Panthers were done. And he was like, no, we have, and he was a younger cat, he was a recruit. Um, we have the Black Panthers, the original Panthers that created the Black Panther newspaper again. And you don't want you to come to one of our meetings. It's like, bet. So I go to these meetings. Bullwick was one of them. Sheba, Safia, all these famous Panthers were there leading off, uh, which was a newspaper committee. So they had this program in which if you signed up, you go through a year leadership program within the Black Panther Party, in which you'll learn everything a, a Black Panther member would know. Um, within that year. And then you work on the newspaper committee. And I was like, bet, you know what I mean? So I started picking that up. At that time, I also have a chapter with Zulu Nation called Natives Chapter, Chapter 50. And so it's not just from media. I have a, a lot of other street gangs, groups, so-called groups, families, organizations, whatever title you want to give it. I have a network, a very big network. So I find myself attracted to that, to that level of, of knowledge 
And that's how I began to know Bullwood. And then after, before the year, the year was over, the younger group that still remained um, decided like, we don't want to just work the newspaper. Why isn't there a party? We want to, we want to be the new Black Panther party. And they were just like, you know, pressured to the point where they said, all right, what we're going to do is instead of just being a newspaper committee, we're going to create the Black Panther Collective. And the Black Panther Collective, the idea was that it'd be a collective of the original Black Panthers and Black Liberation Army members and a new cadre that would be under with that. And, and so I ended up being in the Black Panthers for six years in leadership for eventually I'll get into leadership being there for four years. So in that whole period, um, I've been a, knowing um, Bullwhip and, um, and so many others. That's such an honor. That's one of my high points in life that I was able to sit down and study with so many great minds and people that sacrificed so much and made change history for us, as, especially melanated people in this country and oppressed people in this country. They have done so much that people have no clue down to the breakfast and school and lunch and school, like and WIC and all these programs and housing. Like people don't have an idea that none of that existed prior to the Panthers and the Young Lords and these different groups that actually made it happen. You know, down to putting street lights in streets where, I mean, the basic needs of people, they basically created institutional solutions, which eventually the government would, would try to eliminate them and then readapt them because it was so popular amongst the people and the government couldn't just eliminate it. So those are considered socialist programs nowadays, right? But these are the programs that that a lot of our people survived on because of what they did. So that's, so I meet Bullwhip through that. And to this day, actually, he just sent me a text two days ago. We have a memorial for Thomas Blood McCrary, who just passed away, Blood. Um, and um, he, he was telling me, I gotta do a, I gotta do a piece of artwork for Blood <laughs> next month at the Schaumburg to go present it. I'm like, all right. <laughs> okay. But yeah, we still, another, another just like for me, another, another group that would be my family till the day I die. Okay. Now, <laughs> I know it's a lot. <laughs> you, you've definitely done a lot in your life. Yeah. And it's been a lot. But can I just say on the record, yes. so one of the achievements that we did create was under Giuliani. Um, he, had, he had attacked our community so hard. Like people don't understand that when Giuliani came in, so they hit us with the crack epidemic, AIDS epidemic, and then our neighborhoods were destroyed to the point where it was like no coming back, not the living dead. And Giuliani came in, basically Dinkins laid down a clean foundation and cleaning the mess up. But then Giuliani came in, pushed him out of office. And people know the history. There was even a riot at City Hall with the police department, burnt cars and broke cars up and people could look that up. Um, he used the police department as a Gestapo, like an army. And then what he did was, as soon as he became mayor, he increased the police department to be the biggest police department in New, in New York's history. I'm not sure they were being trained by Israel yet, but eventually this this police department is trained under Israel. I don't know if people know that as a military formation. That's why it's so brutal. But at the same time, Giuliani used them and attacked our communities like you wouldn't believe. Down to the innocent vendors on 125th Street. I mean, they went through. I mean, I got footages that people would not believe how they would take over blocks. Like it was a military formation. So we created was called what was called the, the Anti-Brutality Prevention Project, which was based on the idea of after the uh, um, King, what's his name, um, Larry King? No, no, um, they got beat up by the police. Um, Rodney. Rodney King, sorry, I'm getting old. Rodney King beating um, was the idea of how we could utilize video cameras in a military formation. So we basically created the original idea of Bobby and Yui, but instead of using guns, we used the technology, which we, our, our campaign was from the nine millimeter to the eight millimeter. And what we, what we did was under the William Kunstner Foundation was utilize a group that will actually go out and patrol the police. And we had gold, ghost cards and stuff. We became public enemy number one at that time, not just between the government, but also within other political organizations. Um, as you know, um, what's his name? Um, um, damn, what's his name? This activist. Um, ah, it's right there. But anyway, we we was getting it from all ends, and um, and we created was that program where eventually we would train other groups 
and it will eventually become what is Cop Watch today, which is monitors police through video cameras as well as archives of police brutality throughout the country. So our legacy continued even after the organization um, has has dissolved. But I just wanted to throw that in there. But that was all that was all connected with Bull Whip and those and the elders that were connected with us at that time. Okay. Now why did you decide to get back into art? And can you tell me about those years? Yeah, so that's an interesting story. So what happens is that and this is a great story, actually, and the gallery loves this story as well. Um, it wasn't my choice. It's like, again, you have to like, it's like the universe is funny in this way. Um, my mother had passed, I had hit a really low in my life in which um, everything was falling apart. My mother had passed away. Um, I was losing the job I was at. My marriage was falling apart. Uh, everything was like basically coming back to me. A lot of the dirt, the karma, you could say, was coming back at once. And I was at a really low spot. Then what happens is um, my brother's my brother gets married for the third time. And his wife is a top designer uh, for Diane Van Vugenberg, whatever her name is. And she's the one that built that whole campaign for her. So then because her name was so high as a designer, her name is Heather Harlan, she ended up getting this deal with, with Rachel Roy was going to have, who's a big, big designer um, of color, like, you know, I hate using black and all this stuff. But anyway, back then considered to be the, the biggest um, black designer, woman designer at the time. Um, I like to say melanated. But she was Damon Dash's ex-wife. And um, she was the one that was also like Michelle Obama, um, Oprah, all of them was wearing her dresses, her outfits. They were really expensive, high end. But she got a, she got a, it was a Bloomingdale or Macy's deal. She ended up getting the deal to make a low, like what they would consider a low end lower end type of um, fashion, which was more for the population that could be in their reach. And she got a complete deal from shoes all the way to the bags, everything complete. It was a complete deal with everything in it. And so Heather got hired and the brand was called Rachel Rachel Roy um, line. And um, she got hired as the top designer because as you guys know, these people's names on the brands are not necessarily the designers. They have people that actually design the stuff for them and they just get credit for it. Um, so Heather um, has, has this idea, this is back in about 2009, um, has this idea about graph. Graffiti wasn't hot the way it is right now, especially not in fashion at all. So it was really ahead of the time. So she knew about my past, my history. She has seen some of my books and black books and stuff and artwork. And I was always doing it regardless, it never leaves you. And um, so she hits me up one day and says, I um, got this idea, but it's kind of rough. I'm not sure if it will work, but um, um, can I, do you have some, yes. to be a reference? Like, do you have any any stuff that I could, um, you know, look at? And I, I know giving out published books, mm -hmm. like, yeah, you know, I wasn't paying no mind. I've never thought about myself. And then what happens is um, she comes, gives it back to me for like about a week or something later and says, no, nah, this is not what I was thinking about. What about your black books, your original books? And I was like, oh, yeah, you know, you're my sister in law. Take whatever you want. So I give her like a stack of maybe three or four old books, which has some 70s, 80s stuff, not 70s, 80s stuff, 90s stuff. And, um, and, and it wasn't even my original books. A lot of my original books are gone. And um, so this has some stuff in it. And so, anyway, long story short, I'm at the, my mom's had passed, everything. I'm at the job, about to, about to have my, my, I, they downsizing, so I'm down like maybe my last two weeks there. And I get this phone call from the job. That's why I was telling this story, because it's crazy. It's like the universe, how it, it just worked out. I get this phone call and it's her, she's excited. She's like, I got, you know, I'm in a conference right now. I want to put you on, on this conference call. Somebody wants to speak to you. And I'm at work, you know, like bugging, I'm like, huh? I was like, okay. So she puts me on the speaker phone. And it's like Rachel Roy and his whole team. And she's like, hey, what's up? It's Rachel Roy. And I'm just like, oh, shit, that's crazy. So she's like, um, um, you know, we, we, we fell in love with these patterns. We want to actually, um, you buy some patterns. And you, we want to have a meeting with you about using your patterns on my new line. And it was like, oh, shit, all right, cool. So it ends up being, that ends up fast forward into being like, end up turning into them using some patterns to then become in a collaboration because then what happens is, which was news to me, news to them, was that I had a big following that knew my 80s stories around the world. Like all these writers and people knew about what we did as IBM and knew of Sen 
one and all this stuff said at the time one whatever and um so anyway that that began the ball rolling when did you sell your first piece of fine art um very interesting question um so like i was saying before so 2009 i launched off with this clothing brand rachel roy so i ended up doing macy's windows seven windows so i guess you could basically say there because macy's hired me and paid me to do their seven windows which my brother was a fine artist famous illustrate classical illustrator always said to me like man you don't want to understand how how big that is um anyway um so i would say around that time and then i didn't go through galleries like most people did we went through art expos so i can't that's why i can't really pinpoint it so what happens is because i did the fashion line at 2009 we which people are doing today and i don't i don't like taking credit for things but but rightfully so, um, one of the, because I have my brother who's experienced artist, I'm not educated. I never passed the 10th grade, never got my GED or anything. Um, he went to art school, went through Parsons. He's one of the top five, his name is Ricky Mojica. He's one of the top five classical illustrators in the country. So that's a realist. And he retired doing romance novels and all that stuff. Anyway, um, he's my educator when it comes to the art world. And one of the things we talked about early on when I was doing the fashion stuff was that the straight graffiti, like we said, it's 2009. It wasn't the way it is today. Like people wasn't accepting like the graffiti, graffiti um, stuff yet because it was so technical, it's still seen as street. Um, not like it wasn't street art yet. Like now it's street art. You have both offspring. So people accept it. They got a big range of graffiti that they could, they could pick from. So what happens is we developed what he, he explained to me, like, how we're going to make this cross over. And he was saying, you have to make it into a an abstract version, a fine art version. If you do straight graffiti, it's going to always be stigma. stigma. And graffiti w doesn't get the respect or the money, even though it's so technical and hard. And you take so many years to learn the styles and, and understand how things flow and where things go, even down in Harrow's. It's very technical. And every, every style comes from a different crew, has a lineage. People don't understand this and they don't appreciate it. So my brother was saying to me, like, you'll never get the money as a, as a, as a main artist or the recognition if you just do the graffiti. The graffiti is not going to be respected. It's looked at as, as, the, as a street thing in the main art. And it's not, it's not respected. Just like breakdancing was until now. It's like going into the Olympics. But back then, in fact, reverse to 2009, where was breakdancing at? It wasn't Red Bull, none of these places. It was still underground. And so was the DJ stuff. The DJs wasn't like this whole big thing, like Serato and all this stuff will come years later, a couple, few years later. So at this point, I'm right there in the beginning of something, but we don't know what's going to happen. So we developed, because of my brother's influence and because they took, when they used the Rachel Roy, they took um, patterns out of the Black Book that were basically just bombed out pages. It wasn't, it wasn't a technical, let's say a send one piece outline. It was like pages that I had over the years just bombed out and tagged and did characters here and did, it was just scribbled in different tags and different things and different thoughts and years, numbers and just whatever, right? It's like, right. So they took those patterns. So that gave, gave birth to an abstract um, version of graffiti, which is then what I incorporated. And then when I did the Macy's window, I had to do that. And at that time, I remember that graffiti writers, when they saw it from my own peers, lucky I respect it, they criticized it. They didn't, they didn't like it because to them, it wasn't the technical graph. Mm -hmm. It was this abstract bombed out, you know, version. And they didn't understand it yet. Now they're all doing it. All of them are doing it, right? So then what happens is from there, we end up doing, again, this is not something you would take to a gallery or anything. It's too premature, too early. Um, so what I did was we went to, and we started doing the International Art Expo. So me and my brother would get booths and they were very expensive at that time, about $10,000 a booth, $8,000 a booth. And, but then with your own booth, and I remember being the only writer there. And at one time there was Rascal, but he was doing, so I knew him from back in the days as a young kid, but now he was doing this like Brazilian art, like these characters that were like, so he wasn't doing graph, he was doing this like indigenous type of artwork but me and him connected, but I was in there doing graphs, doing both. It was a mixture. So I had, a, I had done renditions of all my pieces 
whether they were on walls or trains. And what I did was I did them all on trains and different kind of trains. And what I did was I made the trains realistic on how they looked back then, bombed out, laid up, dripping, rusty. And then I would do the pieces and I didn't do them clean. I didn't do it like writers were doing back then. It was all about being clean and, and neat. I was making it look realistic. And that helped cross over into the fine art because it was looked at as more of a, as realism. But, and then I also had the abstract. And then from there, I began to venture into furniture companies, fabrics. I did Culverton. We had the first graffiti um, fabric print um, ever. Um, it was outdoor print, very high end. I went high end on everything because of the Macy's, because of the fashion, the Rachel. Um, the Rachel Roy thing, we'll end up doing another, another collaboration years later. Um, all those were successful, but that's where it began. And then I just, I did a few shows, I think for myself, by, you know, by myself. I never, I never like went through the gallery routes. Um, I've always done things on my own. The, the art expos were very profitable and I could do basically what I want. And then I got into merchandising. So at that point, I would say that it was during maybe 2010, I would say that, I mean, yeah, 2009, 2010, doing the art expos when I first sold my first, what would be considered fine art piece. And then I did a show in Israel um, with a gallery. Um, and I, I, I did some shows like that. And then um, and then I went into, um, um, again, doing merchandising um, and just doing stuff for myself. But yeah, it's been, so around that time, to answer your question, you know, I know I went off, but um, to answer your question, That's it was okay. like about 2009, 10, right after the Rachel Roy, I think I began to sell my own pieces, but never down the route of galleries really. Not the traditional way. I did it more the New York hustling way. <laughs> okay. You spoke about different styles in your art. Is there a certain theme or themes that your art takes? Yeah. So like, um, I had to create series over the years. Um, and um, and this leads up to Gallery d'Orsay, I would say, the gallery I'm in now. Um, so the subway train renditions of one series in which I would do, like I said, I would do, there was six, actually six feet long, six by maybe two or three feet, because they were long canvases. And um, so those are those were considered to be more the graffiti version, but they were, like I said, more of a realistic um, type of paintings. And they were like the subways of that era um, to give people an idea, because I think people didn't understand like what we was dealing with when we used to, like people nowadays would do a street, let's say graffiti piece, whether it's on a freight train or whatever, even the ones that come from out of town and they do the New York City trains. These are all clean trains. These are all like clean canvases. We didn't have that. I'm part of the last generation of the trains. We had a couple of decades of trains being bombed out by the time we got it as young kids. Not only were they bombed out, they were old, they were falling apart, they were um, rusty from, and they were being acid washed by Koch. So every week there would be an acid wash. So the trains were actually being eaten away by acid. And then you had paint pieces under pieces underneath for decades and tags and, and all kinds of stuff that you had to actually like, if it could be visible, you couldn't go over it really because that would cause a conflict. That was like the rules in the street. Um, that'd be beef if you're going over somebody. But then there was also a priority like tags were at the bottom, throw-ups were basically, people didn't really do throw-ups. That was like, to us, especially at IBM, we skipped that part. Um, that was considered a waste of paint and a waste of space doing these bubble letters on trains. We went straight into burners, and that's why IBM was so famous, characters and burners, and our trains had to be, oh, our walls and stuff. Yeah, there was times where we did silvers and gold, but they were still not throw-up letters. They were, they were graffiti letters, but with one, with one or two colors, you know, the color inside and the outline, right? But then that was still an upgrade from throw-ups. They were still respected because they had style, right? But um, we would have to go over people and knowing that if you wasn't doing a straight burner on a train, then you really didn't have a right to go over these people. And if you did, you had to be ready because there was going to be repercussion. There's going to be beefs. They're going to either be crossing out your stuff, but when you run into each other, you're going to be fighting or crews against crews. And you was gonna run into each other in tunnels in the worst places, you know, that you could run into an adversary. So what I did was in those paintings, I painted that. And what I did was I, I painted different tags and different 
styles of tags just to give people this whole idea of what we were seeing as pe as kids. So that's what the renditions are. They're they're graffiti, but they're not the traditional graffiti in which I'm trying to show off my style. As more or less, I'm trying to be realistic of the '80s and the '70s. So then they more like real realist real real realistic paintings versus um, just graffiti pieces. And then I went into the abstract, which I called this something early on because I felt like every art movement had to have like his own name. So it was like uh, graffiti abstract expressionist or something like that came over. I did the hashtag or something. Now people use it, so it's funny. But um, um, so I did this abstract version and then I, I broke into doing um, an abstract version of flags, American flags. And that started off early on I'm not educated in art, so a lot of this stuff is organic, but then later on I end up finding out that there's predecessors on some of these ideas, so which is cool. Um, but I end up doing this flag, a black and white one with a couple of color stars, but I end up selling at one of the art expos. And it was sold by, by it was being put in the lobby of a building, I don't know where. Um, it was this contractor who was also a developer, um, you know, um, of color as well, and and he fell in love with it and bought it, and he paid good money for it at the time, and that gave me the idea of how to cross over in a way, um, and also using the American flag to kind of like tell our story. So the fact that I'm doing them, like even people see them today, they don't understand that a lot of my flags, they're a hidden message because of who's doing it as well. So even if I do a regular flag that doesn't seem like it says anything, it the soul that's in it and the energy that's in it is of a person that's been colonized and comes out of that oppression and it comes from a lifetime of, 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 of that and that community of that. So when I do the flags, I got goosebumps saying it, when I do the flags, they're, they're a flag of, of, of our struggle, of us, of our story. And, and that's what is embedded in it. But at the same time, it is our nationalities that we're born here. Like we have our bloodlines and our roots but at the end of the day, if you're born in America, America is your nation. It's your nation. It's your, is so, and we have a responsibility to it. As messed up as it is, um, at some at some point, as you get older, you realize, even being rebellious, that it it is your country. At the end of the day, so and you have the ability to transform it, um, at least try. So the American flag, kind of like, it tells those different stories. It tells a story. So what I end up having to do is to grow. That's one of one of the hottest sellers actually in the gallery, um, in the galleries in Boston. So mm -hmm. <laughs> it helps with that. But the American flag, um, I began to put in, in the beginning, I began to put in lines of the constitution. One of the flags that went sell, that I ended up selling on the side, it went sell in the gallery. It was called three, fi um, three fifths. And um, if you know about the three fifth clause um, and it had, it had the actual writing. I mean, I ended up writing it but I had the line of the three-fifth clause in the Constitution. So I kind of like also saw the, the American flag series as an educational, um, I studied the Constitution heavy um, as a way of educating our own people. Majority, I came to realize that even, forget about my community, but majority of Americans don't know the Constitution, don't know what's in it, which is, is kind of sad, man, because like even if you complain about the country or you have issues with it, you should at least read the Constitution and understand it because it's the foundation of this country and where everything comes from. So even when I saw the debates with Trump, and I'm not a nobody, so I'm not a Republican or Democrat, but the thing is that when you educate it to this level, you understand things differently and you see things differently than mainstream. And like mainstream is going to tell you one thing, but if you understand the foundation of something, you don't need to hear it from everybody else and, and their opinions. You, you know the root of it. So you're able to understand things differently. So even when a person, whether it's Trump or Biden or Obama, whoever says something, Bush or whatever, if you understand the foundations, right, and 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 how that's 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 not classified, but how it's structured, then what happens is you really know what they're saying and what they mean or where they're getting it from. But if you don't know, you kind of like. You just assume it, really, but you don't know that you assume it. You think you know, but unless you read and understand what the foundations are. So like the three-fifth clause, for instance, everybody thinks, all right, it's strictly about um, three-fifths of a human being, black people. And if you have one drop of black blood makes you black, um, and then you fall under where you three-fifths of a human being, and you don't have 
those are the rights that you have on the three the three fifth clause. But what it comes down to it actually ties into the to the electoral college, and it has to do with states that didn't have the same population as let's say cities like like let's say New York. So you had down south states that had their rule that had less population, but they owned slaves, massive amounts. So they end up making it so that it could balance out in a way that they could count in slaves as as a vote to the owner of the slaves, right? But three fifths of each slave would equivalent would make up that portion of the population, in which then they could balance out the election numbers. So there's a lot to it. Yeah, there's a thing about a race components and oppression components, but there's also a whole electoral college that's tied into this whole electric uh, election and the way it functions when it comes to numbers. And then it comes down to how much we're needed to balance out the system, even if we're slaves. So people don't understand that it runs deep. So I used, I used a lot of what I was studying within the flags to kind of like leave an imprint, historical imprint within my art, because these get amendment, amended as well and they change, but also to educate and to also show the hypocrisy within my artwork of society. So like the flags became really powerful for me as well as I think, like my brothers say, these things are gonna outlive me. They're gonna be my legacy later on, which, you know, it's not what I do, but it's good to know that you could, through your art, if you could do something that's gonna outlive you, just like we did with the graffiti and now we see how hip hop and everything is gonna outlive the founding fathers and sisters that lay down the foundation. That's the same energy I put into these artwork. So then that became to be, getting back to your question, that became two categories. So the colorful flags, originally I called the series, I started breaking things down into series. So like the subway um, train series is one, uh, the American flags became to be called the Americano. But then I got into, because of the gallery and the commercializing of certain stuff, like I said, three fifths wouldn't sell. It was a beautiful painting. It wouldn't sell in the gallery. Because think about it, collectors, they, they don't want something that powerful. Not while you're alive. When you're dead, yeah like Basquiat, but when you're a live living artist, not too many people want that. But then I end up getting it back from the gallery and selling it to, to my own peers. And they pay top, they pay good money for it because they understood it and they wanted that. But you don't really get that in a commercial space. So what I had to do was I had to tone down a lot of, not tone it down, tone it down in titles as well as what message I wanted to give out and it just do the Americana series in color flags which became to be more of decorative in a way because it's an abstract graffiti flag right version but then what i did was then to complement our struggle i did a, a one that's called black cotton which is a black and white flags mainly in grays they're not really color and those i got the title from a tupac song black cotton and those actually sell pretty good too um because i was able to define that so the fact that there's an option now where if you get the Americana series, which is just the colorful flags, interior designers or people that, especially like in Boston, which has been featured in magazines and stuff out in Boston, a lot, these flags, um, they're, not, they're not coming at you with anything, any viewpoint. They're just beautiful works of art, right? That can be interpreted however you want to interpret it. But the black, but the black cotton are specifically meant to remind people of our history and our struggle. They, and, and they get appreciated for that by certain collectors, but it's not some that's, that's toned down because they call black kind, it's from the black kind series, but it gets appreciated because we in a time now that people understand our story, they want it out more and they can, re they can receive it. So yeah, that's another series then. Then there's the abstract graffiti, which is just an abstract graph and now i got i got a couple series i can't remember them all right now because they've been growing over the years but i literally had to break off series into the artwork which is a great thing when you have to i'll have to go back and look at all my series but they they have um they have grown which is amazing for me because um that's that's the story right of the artist of how your artwork ends up growing and you end up understanding and and even understanding society and how they see things, where I have to break down the flags 
in, in two different categories. And who knows in the future if it ends up being more. But, you know, like that's that's something that my heart then educates me. You know what I mean? Um, I mean, I mean, just to get into a quick story, like the gallery, the flags are so powerful. Um, there's, there's been stories behind it from when one, and they had to do it around the elections. There was one, and I'll share this one. Um, I'll share two real quick. Um, one was, and she's a collector. She's a constant collector now. But she had reached out to me. She bought a smaller flag. And this is when Trump was elected. And she's, I won't say her name and stuff because I don't, I don't put these messages out with people's names. But she bought a smaller one. And she never bought a piece of art before. She went to the gallery with a friend. She emailed me. She texted, she messaged me on Instagram to tell me this whole story. She said, she said, I had to buy this flag. I don't really, it's out of my budget, right? Because she's buying it through the gallery, right? So um, she said she had to buy it because her husband, and they're Caucasian, right? And this shows you how powerful art is. And um, Trump had just been elected. And, you know, like people was, back then was going crazy over this. Like whether, you know, people were supporting it, but people that were against it was really going nuts. And the media was feeding this whole thing, right? Like the world was going to end, right? And and she ended up buying this piece because her husband um, was feeling guilty as a, as a Caucasian male about when Trump was elected and committed suicide, killed himself out of guilt. And she was living with this. And when she saw this painting and the title of it, and it was a flag, and one of the stars was red and it was dripping like it was blood, right? She actually bought it because it gave her it gave a relief that a person of color actually made this flag and um, and she could see it and it was for her. Like she said it to me, she was like, that was for me. I never would have went to that. My friend pulled me, was in Boston, took me to see these galleries, went to gallery to say sorry and had to buy it. And I don't even have the money really to spend on it, but I had to get it. And and she ended up buying another one. Now she moved on, she's with somebody else. And she has, she has two sets of them actually. She bought another counterpart to it. But just to say that is like to show you how art actually crosses over lines and then you meet these people and it's not as clear as people think as black and white or brown and white, whatever, right? It's, it's more complex when you're dealing with America and people um, and art actually brings that out. Um, another quick story, do we have time? Yes. Another quick story was that, and this is what the gallery loves because for some reason my artwork brings this out of people. Um, it was during, again, the Trump era. And I had this flag and I had did a train because I'm not I'm not for neither political party. I see political parties. I see the Democrats and Republicans as two wings on the same bird. Right. And they flap. Right. <laughs> so whichever. So you take it as you want to take it. But that's how I see it. Right. So the issue is a whole bird. <laughs> right. And um, so I had did it when when Trump was elected. I was strategic, too. I don't go. I, I look at what's going to be a better outcome, even at the worst of times, right? Um, so the election was happening. So I did a subway train, which I still was one of the only trains I got left, I got, I kept to myself, because I know in the future it's gonna be, it's part of my state pieces. Mm -hmm. I always keep a piece of each series that's gonna be, that I don't sell, that I keep for my state. But it's a red train, and people could look this up. I might still have it on my sites and stuff. But it said, um, it said, it was based on um, Koch. Koch was like our enemy in the city when he got elected, right? And he made graffiti and even hip hop, just graffiti really in general, public enemy number one. So we had writers that had did trains. He had did a whole campaign against us, if you remember. And um, there was writers when during the election did a, a dump Trump, uh, the dump Koch train and one that said, fuck Trump, um, Koch. And those ran and we was like, yes. And that's to show you the power of hip hop or graph or whatever. Uh, urban art or whatever, um, that you could express yourselves on that level and actually make an impact. And he really is in Star Wars in that documentary. You guys want to look it up. So he, he, he was actually fond of it because he saw himself as getting to us. But in reality, for our communities, it was like an outcry. Like he was like another Giuliani. He was like a way of saying, F this guy, you know what I mean? He's attacking us. So I ended up taking that same concept. Again, when I do these trains, I do it as not of myself, I do it of a generation. So I ended up doing a red train. I still have the six feet. And it said, it said, fuck Hillary first. And then I went over with a Trump. So the whole message was, again, like I say, it's, it's two wings on the same bird. 
was basically my message in there. And again, I did it in a way that I didn't do a style. I did it the way it would have been done if different artists that did it. So I put myself out of myself and out of my skill level and did it as if, you know, this is a bombed out train, you know, and here's one graffiti writer does fuck Hillary because she's good. She's expected to win. Mm -hmm. And I did it a, a easy style, not a, but not a, a crazy style. I did it as if somebody just went in quick and did like the F, like the F Koch. They, it wasn't no fancy stuff. It was like a quick, you know, quick pieces. Right. And then, and then I went over the Hillary with Trump. And again, the message is that people expect the Hillary to win, but then Trump ended up winning, but basically F both of them. But it was not just them as individuals, it's F both parties, <laughs> right? right? So it's the bigger picture. So, but what happened is because of that train, this collector, this guy went in to the gallery and this took, I laid him down the foundation for what happened. He goes into the gallery and sees this flag that I did and, and falls in love with it. He's patriotic, falls in love with it, catches his eye, he sees it all the way in the back. I'm being told this by the brokers in the gallery. He sees it all the way in the back, he's looking goes, let me check out, he wants to go see that painting. He goes all the way to the back, is in the middle, and he sees, he, he, he falls in love. He starts asking about it. He looks it up. At that time, I just did the F Trump, the F Hillary, F Trump trade. He's a Trump supporter, mm -hmm. right? Like, not so, I don't know if supporter, but he's a person that's obviously, um, you know, back in Trump in the election. So he's like, he goes back to the broker and goes, I really like this painting, but I'm looking at it. And, and remember, I'm going over the Hillary. So if you look at it quickly, all you see is the Trump and the Hillary's underneath. So you have to look at it good to understand or read the title because it says F Hillary, F Trump, right? So he didn't, I guess, didn't see that part. He just sees the Trump, fuck Trump. And then the momentum at that time was that people were really against Trump, right? They were upset. This is after the election, right? It was that first year. So the funny story with this, and this is what the gallery fell in love with my artwork more, um, was that the guy literally walked in that gallery, walked out five times that day, four or five times that day, because he felt that that painting was calling him, that it really, he really loved that painting. And he never felt this connection with art before. But at the same time, his politics was like, no, I can't, this guy's anti-Trump. I can't support this artist. He literally went home that night, called the broker that night, asked if that painting was still there, that he was still conflicted. He eventually slept on it. The next day he walked in and bought the painting. And he told the broker, he said, you know, I just learned a valuable lesson. He said, oh, I was gonna deprive myself of something that I really, really love and want all because of politics. And, and this has taught me a lesson in which that's not as important as it is for me to satisfy what I deserve to give myself. I was gonna deprive myself and this artwork stood in my mind. He said, he told her, I couldn't sleep all night thinking about this. So this is the power of these flags are actually, they cross over because I do them in a certain way that, that everybody could relate to them. And that's why I had to break off and do the Black Cotton series because then I did need one for my outlet, but that doesn't necessarily need to be an Americana. The Americana could be more of the tribute to the American struggle and to us. And it's still, it's coming from me. So it still has that. But the black kind specifically gives me the room to be like, this is about us and our struggle as people of color, oppressed, ex-slaves, ex-colonized people, and still going through struggle in America. So yeah, that's what these series, I got into a whole big thing, but I had, to awesome. share those, I had to share those stories because I think that as an artist, that's beyond money. Those are the type of rewards that, that stay with you forever or like really or uh, what if you're a real artist if you're just a commercial artist that just wants to make money but if you're an artist that's like a payment there you know, of a lifetime those are the those are the things that you want and the thing is that so many of us only experience it when we're dead like the basquiat's in us so for me to experience it while i'm alive and and having a, a gallery that goes and appreciates that and go that's why i decided to go really exclusive with them i don't want to put myself in other places where is your gallery? Um, gallery Show D'Orsay me. is in, it's on, it's on Newberry Street in Boston. So do you want to know of how I got, is Please. that part of it? Yes. So it's a unique story. Um, I, I was out there on a trip. Um, I was with um, the girl I was dating at the time and we was, she was on a business trip. We was out to dinner with her and our co-worker, uh, our co, 
company, whatever. I can't remember what the title would be. But I saw them strategizing as two women, strategizing some meetings the next day, which had to do with million dollar deals. And I'm sitting at the table and I'm like, damn, I'm feeling the pressure. I'm like, <laughs> and the hustling comes out of me like, damn, I'm sitting at this table with these women and they're talking about how they're going to, they got three meetings lined up tomorrow and how they're going to do this, do that, and how much money they're going to pull out of these investors and all. And I'm sitting here like, damn, I got to up my game, man. I got to like up my game. So anyway, we go out from dinner. We walking down Newberry Street. It was loaded with galleries. This is like Fifth Avenue. Uh, it's a college area, but like the galleries are like Fifth Avenue type galleries. They like everything is is pl- is plush plush whatever that word is. And um, as we walk in, they still talking, and I'm I'm looking at all these galleries, and they close at night, and I start to strategize like, all right, I'm not. I could just be sitting around tomorrow or looking at the city or doing this, or I could go out here and hustle. So while I was listening to them, at the same time, my mind starts making. I go, you know what? I'm gonna go out here tomorrow, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do my thing, like in that New York hustle, you know, mm-hmm. that ground roots, you know, no agent, no manager, no nothing, right? I said, so I, I was like, you know, and I could get, I could clean myself up pretty nice. So I had just gotten the prints of the, actually some G clays of the train, and I was showing her. So I had them in Boston with me. So they were high end G clays for people that don't know are high end prints. So they don't call them prints at that level. They call G clays. Right? And those are the ones you do limited edition and you number them, you sign them, and they become almost as valuable as the original paintings. Right, But they have to be printed a certain way, certain paper, certain quality. Um, that's what makes them a G clay versus a print. Anyway, um, so I take my little book. I get ready in the morning like they do. They bounce. I bounce. Boom. I have my little bright shirt, but I still have my jeans, my shoes on. Right, I look kind of casual, but mm-hmm. you know, fly casually, <laughs> casually fly. And um, I take my little notebook and I have my prints in there. And I literally start going to every single gallery on that street, including the Boston's um, Art, Boston's Artist Guild. There was everything. But Gallery Dorsey ends up being the first gallery before from that starts the whole thing. They're in the best spot. They're right near the park. Um, they're in 33rd Newberry Street. So they, they're right next to Boston Common, Common and all this other stuff, right? So anyway, um, I go in there. Boom. I meet the top. She's there today. Um, she's still there today, Martha. Um, um, I walk in there. She buzz me in because this is high end, <laughs> really high end, right? Definitely out of my league at the time. I walk in um, out of my league, you know, meaning in the art world would look at. Not not for me. Like anyway, but I walk in. I, I walk in and I, you know, she's really friendly, nice. But I guess she thought I was more, you know, like she's looking at it as a client. But I'm looking around, and then I have my story in my head, you know, that's New York hustling. And I, so I, I, I'm like, wow, I didn't know Boston had this art scene like this. And she was like, yeah. So I'm looking at, and as I'm looking around, man, the paint is like 250000 They like, and they're all in gold frames. There's all these, there's nothing, nothing of graffiti or anything on that level. Everything is like Picasso's, murals, and all these high-end statues. And, and the least painting I saw that day was 88000 I still remember. Yeah, exactly. So I'm looking around like, wow. And I'm thinking in my mind, like, damn, I need to be in this. I need to be in a place like this. So it's funny because I had just did a show, and this is the way the universe works. I just did a show with a friend. She wanted to curate, and we we did a little gallery show. Didn't really sell anything. So a couple of little small pieces, right? It was more, but I had this puzzle piece that I created, like the little finger puzzle, but it took mm-hmm. me years to make. It's, it's like 16 canvases. It's like 16 feet long on wood. It's heavy. We had bolted onto the ceiling and I had, we had just did it. She had made a, the, the curator had made this nice video of me messing with it. Cause you take out one piece and you can actually move it around, right? Like the puzzle piece. I still have it. So anyway, I, we ended up putting that right away on my website. I just got my website redone and it was the first, on the first page of my website, you see this video of me moving this puzzle piece, right? So it was funny because as I'm looking around, she's, Martha says to me, Hey, you know, also, you know, she thinks I might be a collector, you interested or whatever. So she's like, and I, so I tell her the whole story. I'm like, I run down this little story. Like, I'm visiting Boston. I'm this artist from New York. Wow, I didn't know Boston had this art scene. And she's like, oh, you're an artist. Yeah. What kind of art do you do? Well, here's my website. So I show her the prints. I pull out the, the G clays and she goes, oh, we don't deal with G, with G clays here. Everything here is original. So she really didn't even look at them. 
So I was like, <laughs> I was like, damn, I blew it, right? I'm thinking to myself like, damn, this is out of my league. Like, look, even even just showing what I have, and they G clays. I'm thinking like, you know, this is, you know, these are high level prints. These are not the, you know, these are expensive prints. Like, so she shot that down. So as I'm walking around, I'm just like in my mind, like not daydreaming, but kind of like you're looking at everything and kind of like trying to like situate yourself. And then I hear her say, hold up, wait a minute. We might be interested in something like this. So I go, huh? So she calls me over and she's on my website. She's already doing the research, we right? Because if you Google send one, boom, a whole bunch of stuff comes up. If you Google George Marilla, a whole bunch of stuff. So so she's she's out there, she's looking at the puzzle piece. She goes, tell me about this. And remember, it's an abstract graffiti piece that says love. And it has a, like a Che character that has like, uh, like if somebody uh, pasted on eyes. So it's like real abstract, right? Um, but it's still is like street art. It's like a bombed wall because it's so big. But then it's a puzzle piece, right? That could turn into endless amount of pieces of art if you keep moving it around. So anyway, the video is showing that. So she calls me over and she's like, well, tell me the story with this. So she's all enthusiastic about it. So I was like, oh, man. She goes, how much you think? How much is something like that? And I was like, I never priced it. God, that to me would be above 100 thou, right? Um, because I'm looking at the stuff that they sell in the numbers and I'm equivalent the amount of work I did and how unique that piece is because I made all the tracks out of wood exactly. Mm -hmm. I took these canvases and actually duplicated the game entirely, making the tracks by hand, you know, cutting Mason Knight, making the tracks, just like the puzzle piece, the way it originally is. So it even gets stuck the way mm -hmm. it's originally just like the same way. So it, was, it took a tremendous amount of work. It took a couple of years actually to make. Um, so, um, so yeah, throw that number, right? I just say something like that. I was like, I never evaluated it. So she goes, all right. So we take that information. She goes, you know, I said, I'm about to go to the UK. Um, I'll be back in a couple of weeks. She was like, well, email us because we actually have another galleries in the city and, and throughout the country. And one is in Miami. And we, we was talking about venturing into, you know, at some kind of street art type stuff, but we're not sure. And it was like, all right. So I end up that day, long story short, I end up going to every single gallery, not the next door. I didn't get the same reception. I actually got the racist part where I walked in and they didn't want to even talk to me. Like, what are you doing here? Like, don't even, like, don't even come in. Like, I got that. So it was like, so I got the raw reality. And then I ended up, like I said, knocked on every single gallery door, did the same routine, got the information, got, I had a, my whole notebook was full of literally like 20 different galleries and numbers and contacts. So I was in Europe and I was planning when I got back to reach out to all these people. But again, I got then coming back from that trip, I was all backed up you know, all this stuff. I never got to reach them, reached them. And maybe a couple weeks later, I get a call from Martha saying, hey, what happened? I ne we never heard from you. So that bugged me out. I was like, shit. So we ended up setting a meeting and long story short, man, after, you know, we end up making agreements and um, signing a three-year contract, which now has been way over, maybe six years now, <laughs> five, six years. But, um, yeah, it just it just naturally came to be, um, and I'm in I'm in one of the top galleries in the country, which is amazing. I'm hanging. I'm literally doing shows with Picasso and myself as the two main artists, which is wow, incredible. Like so for me, like for the hip hop, when we talk about graph and hip hop, to me, that's the achievement. Was the achievement was that I was able to break into some and lay down a foundation to be amongst. The masters, you know, the murals and all these other famous, you know, considered masters. And, and I'm seeing the comparison of saying, you're them in their days, they were doing this because of what they were going through mm -hmm. in Paris or wherever else they come in from, these different artists. They were they were you in those days and you were them now. So it's been incredible. So yeah, I just thought I'd fill that in because I think a lot of young artists need to understand that um that you need to really like break out that norm and also um, vision like what you vision um, should be more complete switching topics <laughs> today you're the president of the board at your residential co-op apartment <laughs> building well uh, it's a michelama it's a rental it's a uh, michelama yeah building so it's not a co-op but yeah okay so i mean <laughs> what neighborhood do you currently live in and 
Tell us about your, your adventure to becoming the president of the board. Oh, man, this just happened, actually. Um, I still live in the same neighborhood. I'm on 94th Street in Aston, I'm literally across the street from the tenement I was born in because I've been divorced. Um, but my family still lives on a block away. So I'm still in my neighborhood, which is a blessing, but also a curse, again, as everything else, because it's been so gentrified. Half of it you don't even recognize. The people that are left that you know are uh, strung out on drugs, and they die basically almost every week. So... But then what happens is, um, I don't know, it's 75% seniors and um, they've been being mistreated. The building's been mistreated, it's been mishandled. Um, it's, it's gone under ownership, which are like LLCs, which are then pocketing majority of the money, all these grants and stuff to build. The building ain't receiving it, they getting it. And they have a non-for-profit running it. And it was a mess. And um, so, we, you know, I go to the tenant meetings and nobody really, I don't really know everybody like that. Like, we know each other as neighbors and stuff, but I don't think they know my story about the Panthers and all that stuff. Like, all that stuff is, you know, water under the bridge in a way. But um, it turned out to be they were going to have the new elections. There hasn't been a, a real official tennis tenant president because of the pandemic stuff. Somebody self-appointed themselves, so that wasn't official. And then they were going to have the first elections a couple months ago, and I started getting nominated. And I was just like, you know, I started in the meeting where people was like, well, you're running. I'm looking at these people like, okay, like, this is weird. They're like, all right. Like, so I wasn't really looking forward to running. And I was basically strong armed to run by the older people, which I took again as an honor because that means that people look at you in a certain light, like your conduct daily. Um, they respect you and they look at you in a certain light. And yeah, we literally started now in January, but I st we started like two months ago. And literally, I got on the community board seven meeting. Um, you can look this up on YouTube. Mm -hmm. uh, October, blew up the spot, told them everything that was happening. We haven't had a compact to work in three years. We had scaffolding for five years. We The building was a mess. It's a wreck. I brought up the seniors. I did it really just to introduce the new board. But then I ended up giving these complaints. Long story short, we became priority number one. Community boards opened these investigations. They came and did a tour. And we basically get everything done. The, the next week, we have the compact to work in. We have um, the none the, the washers were working, and they were talking about it's going to take a year. So we had washers not working for, you know, the laundry room for a few for a few weeks, and they talking about for seniors and stuff. So I brought all this up in a public record form, and we literally got it fixed that same week. We got the whole building transformed. Right now, the construction for the scaffolding is nonstop because they want to get this done and finished and. It's incredible the the stuff we did. So now there's some openings on community board seven. I've been asked to run for that. <laughs> so I don't know if I am because this community president thing has been a little challenging. Mm -hmm. But but I actually ride the ride of the I actually put myself at this age, I go with the universe. And if it's something that that it, I, you know, that's something bigger than me wants that I'm supposed to be doing, then at this stage of my life I just do it. I just show up for it. And it's also my mother's legacy. She was, this is what she did. So in a way, it's like, I think she's also guiding a lot of this madness <laughs> in a good way. But I'm proud of it, actually. I'm really proud. And I'm proud that we got, we done, I've been told that we've done more in this short amount of time than, than almost anything in the past. So it's been, it's been, <laughs> and I credit that to my experience in the Panther stuff. I think the organizational skills, all, everything came into play. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a great example of your involvement in your own community. Oh yeah, absolutely. But you have quite a few, you know, stories about your involvement with charitable groups. Oh yeah, and organizations. Yeah. Could you just touch on your community work with charitable organizations? Absolutely. That's been part of my beginnings because that's been something that, like, my neighbor has got a Riverside, which is a community center, but I had a summer camp when we was kids. They also have legal housing, legal. Um, um, the um, depart departments that deal with with for the community, so they have a lot of community outreach program stuff that they provide. So I've worked with them. They actually, I worked with them in the Beacon program. We created a, a curriculum called Arts on Kicks, where we do the chucks, um, and and then we because of that curriculum, we got I was able to open the center up for individual grants, which now they use for individual artists. So they back they back me up a lot too, even with the issues. With, and they're powerful. They're actually really powerful organization if you look up God or the side. But then that broke off to where 
a friend of mine who we grew up with who's a break dancer. Um, he um, runs the Children's Village up in Harlem, which deal with teens. Um, it's an alternative to going to Rikers Island. They, they, they put them in these programs. So I do maybe two, ye two, two a year of, of, of class, uh, like little workshops, which are hard on kicks, where I show them how to, within the two hour things. So that's one. One right now, another one is international, which I end up meeting through a friend in the UK. It's called, um, it's called um, Last Night DJ Saved My Life. And they're a big organization that runs around the country, I mean the world, and actually um, provide even drinking wells, like water wells, they raise money, but they also build like these music studio schools in, in the most rural, worst places you could imagine in order to inspire and they get donations of equipment. So they opened that up to being um, a visual art as well. So we did the first tour in Tanzania, Africa, and a compound, and it was all these, it is, Thrown, kids that are basically thrown away. Um, some got AIDS, some got from the heroin trade, um, the sex trade. Um, so they're on this compound, and it was really poor compound, but at least it kept them safe and fed them. And so we went, they build a school, we raise, we donate art, and they also raise money and they get equipment and they build, they build these schools and they build a music um, studio school with an art school in it. And we went out as a group. Um, I'm the only one from America, and we we um, um, did teach them how to do the murals, but we also teach them how to do shirts, still screening. Um, they learn all the music stuff to record and engineering, and they begin to get these skills. And actually, we did that a few years back, and half of the kids are now grown. They got good clothes on. They moved on. We got them in galleries in London, supports it. So it actually trans, trans, it trans, it transmits them from that world into into making some for them, giving them the opportunity to make some through the arts. So now I just got called that they just did one in Sierra Leone, but Sierra Leone is wrecked from the diamond trade, but they just did the first one. And now the second one is in April and I'm invited to be on that one. So get to do it again. That's one of my, those are probably one of my favorites because to go to Africa because of our history as well as Afro-Caribbean to be able to travel there and also the welcome when I got to Tanzania, man, the first thing um, um, yeah, they said to me was, "Welcome home, brother." So you know, wow. and that brings that brings like you could just see, man, wow. for me, it, it touches me. You know, I literally kissed the kissed the ground, man. It was like because you feel it, you feel that that it is home. It is home. Like you are, you are part of you that was missing. It's like been fulfilled. But I get I get goosebumps. That's, that's I get emotional. Yeah, it was powerful. It was fucking powerful. I got there and it was like off the plane, man. You had to take this long flight and then you take another charter flight to Moshi to Tanzania. And it was like, welcome home, brother. It was like, damn, man. Like, I never even met these brothers before. And this is the welcome I got, you know? And it was just love and the level of energy is crazy and creativity, even amongst the kids. It's like, I can't even explain it. The level of dancing and artistic and just happiness even through their misery even through their pain it's just like it's incredible it's like the kids here but just magnetize it a million times over the energy is non-stop it's like just every second playing the gongas or doing this you know and doing that and art just it's just like it keeps a person like me at 54 alive man it's like so i'm looking forward to this trip but this trip is a little rougher because the territory is is really bad it's really like the conditions are really they left after the diamond trade after everything they did they left that place really decimated you know just left that but they already laid the foundation has been beautiful they've been doing murals they hired already some of the locals so now it's so i'm, I'm actually coming in there on the tail end of that but i'm excited that's in april so i'm excited for that but those are the those are the fun. so i've always so that's one of the things even when i was struck even when i wasn't making good money in the art and there was, you know, as an artist, you go up and down. But there was a time when I was literally starving. Like, I didn't eat for days, literally. I dropped to 155. But I was still healthy. But um, um, I was still doing a charity. And the charity thing is always, when you're working with kids, or you, especially when you come out of that um, environment, and you could think back of the certain people that helped you when you was, in the, when you was that kid. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, you had a lot of people that did bad things to you, but you always had that that individual, that light, that individual that saw you differently, 
that treated you differently. It was love, right? When you could do that as an artist, again, there's not money and there's nothing that could pay pay you pay pay that. Like that's that's those are the ultimate satisfaction for me as an artist and as a person that's been through so much that it, that I could I could receive that. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And this reminds me of what Yui said now, and I, I kind of like in that part with it, like Yui P. Newton of the Panthers, which I have tatted, tatted here, um, in Revolutionary Suicide, there's a whole statement about, an opening statement about what you gain and what you lose. And one of the things that he says in there is like, you know, I lost the love of one to gain the love of many, of all, I should say. And that's kind of like how this feels. Like I gone through divorces and split ups and I'm basically by myself with my little dog. But then at the end of the day, like I don't get the love individually is a sacrifice, but because of the charity work, I get the love of many. So Absolutely. as an artist, that's like, to me, it's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful reward for the pains and the suffering experience from the past. It makes it all worth it now. Wow. Wow. <laughs> what are your thoughts on street art becoming this global phenomenon today? You know, can you believe it? Talk a little about Well, it. I think I think when we talk about the graph, I, I always see it as, as a one big unit with hip hop, right? Because it's all part of it's they all elements of well, what people know today, because it doesn't it wasn't originally a part of hip hop. Hip hop obviously comes after these elements already pre existed, included B boy and B girl. Like all this came together later, right? But for what the world knows as the graph styles and even the breakdancer styles and the dress styles, well, that's all hip hop, right? Um, because the graph before hip hop wasn't the same graph that the people fell in love with. The styles, everything is different. The colors, even the mentality, right? And the same thing with breakdancing when it was up rocking and it was the gang, the outlaw gangs, it wasn't the same B boy and a B girl that becomes out of hip hop. The same thing with the DJ, you know? At one point it was, just the jams and the DJs. It wasn't this 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 whole thing, you know what I mean? That's all hip hop. The same thing with, you know, MC and Master Ceremonies coming into rap, you know, becoming rap. It wasn't the same thing, but and then the obviously knowledge of self, which is the element that most people don't know that's number one in hip hop is knowledge of self, right? The other physicals. But saying that, I think to answer your question with the street art is to ask the question of all the elements. Um the, all the elements have evolved into something that's incredible. And I tell this to people all the time, like, like what people don't understand today is like, and you're from this generation, so you're part of this. We, we came out of the worst circumstances and the poverty and the abuse, and we was thrown away. And yet we was able as kids to give a world this gift, this incredible gift that's worldwide now. And that's providing so much, not just in culture, because we dominate every culture. Like you just mentioned street art, right? So graph and street art now dominates, dominates. It's not mm -hmm. every art form out of, out of the water. Like nobody cares about nothing else. They care about, even now you even got realists that are now doing spray paint work. You see them on the, on the buildings and that's what street art is. Break dancing is in the Olympics. You know, mm -hmm. you got athletics, you know, doing this. DJ, look at what that's become a phenomenon, right? Incredible phenomenon. Right? That's crossed all the barriers of every group of people, right? Rap industry, uh, nothing dominates that in the music, right? It's the number one pop culture, every genre of music, R&B, and that's been happening since the 90s. We've just been dominating, right? So to answer your question, I think, again, it goes into all the elements. Um, it's a gift. It's a gift that we gave the world, and it's a gift that that to see it grow, you know, at one point, you know, of course, from the graffiti mentality or the hip hop mentality, even when early in rap and when you have PM Dawn and Karis one beat him up, I was there, I threw him off the stage and MC Hammer coming out. We didn't accept that. We was like rebellious to it. The Vanilla Ices and all that. We was like, nah, that's not hip hop. That's not rap. That's not down with us. That's some sellout stuff. But now it's different. Now those barriers don't exist. Now you could. You don't have the, the lines we had. Now you can basically take from what we created or developed and it, it, it's grown, it's grown into everything. So when you look at it as an adult, you gotta like, like look at it with this, this look of, of like us as parents, as a child, 
has now grown and become his own. So that's what these elements have become. So you still got, but the good, the beautiful thing about hip hop and about these elements is that they still have their grassroots. They haven't lost the original element. Like you could still find the original rap battles if you look for it. They're not as commercial mm -hmm. as the industry. You still, with well, skills based, you still find original DJs that are battling the DMCs and all these, mm -hmm. and not just the ones that are doing it on computers and digital. Right, you got the ones that are still doing vinyls and 45s and, and all that scratching and, and rocking it, right? You still have the original graffiti writers that are still strictly about letters and styles and the way they go and the way they the way they were supposed to be formulated versus and then the same thing goes with um what did I miss? Um I see a DJ uh <laughs> break dancing break dancing too. You still have an element where the mainstream, which is like the Olympics, where it's more of the athletic moves. And then you still could go down to the foundation and found, find the original battles where it's still a dance. Because that's what Ken Swift has an issue with, mm -hmm. where that, that break dance, B-boy and B-girl, it's, it's a dance. You have to dance, not just make these moves. It has to be a dance. Incorporate the moves, not the moves, and then incorporate a little bit of dance. Mm -hmm. But again, this is the way it's grown because now the moves have become beyond the laws of physics. Now you have people doing stuff with their bodies that you can only imagine in movies with special effects are actually are doing it. I mean, hanging with one arm, holding the entire bodies at a 45 degree angle where the muscles don't even work like that. Like it's, it's, it's incredible to watch. And that goes with all the elements. So seeing, getting to your question, seeing street art, um, I see the, all these as offsprings of the original. So street art is to me now, I accept it more because and I, and I admire it and I appreciate it for what it is because it's now an offspring of what we introduce the world. You know, and me being part of the last generation, I have the privilege of gaining what the prior generations didn't make or, or to get to develop until it reached us. And then we developed it with the fashion, with everything. We brought it all together. And that's what the world fell in love with. And that's how the package was sold to the world and accepted by the world was that this last generation was able to package it in such a way and live it in a lifestyle that people were able to interpret it and take it and understand it and absorb it to where it now lives and it will live forever, forever. And it will just keep generationally offspringing. So I, I, I actually, against a lot of the graffiti community, I actually appreciate it all as extension of what the same way we was probably not appreciated. I was part of Sticko Kids crew, and the earlier generation didn't like the Sticko Kids. <laughs> they were trying to get into the downtown punk rock scenes, the Basquiat's and the, and the Dozers and them. They wanted to get into with the with you know the mainstream with the Madonnas hanging out with them and the Blondies. While we was more, we didn't want to be in the books. We didn't want. We didn't care about the Martha Coopers and the Andrew. We saw that selling out. We wanted to stick them up. We was in the tunnels as the young kids, <laughs> and I remember Polk saying, "Yo, we have a catch Henry down here. We're gonna take his camera." We're gonna rob them, right? That's that's our mentality. So you know, like to say that I come from where a place where we didn't see the growth. We wanted to keep it where it was at, and then now to see it where it is, and me older to be able to have lived a lot. I've lived a lot of people that didn't get to see this evolution that I actually have to appreciate it and go because I understand the earlier struggles of when it was going up and down, and sometimes it was just a fad. It wasn't gonna. You know, if it wasn't for the next generation, breakdancing wouldn't continue, or this wouldn't continue, or the graph wouldn't continue. And there was a period where, when the rap industry took off, all these other elements pretty much died out. Nobody was really doing it. Mm -hmm. A small, very small groups were still holding on to that because that's all they had, their, own, their only legacy, you know? Um, so to see it is like, wow, this, this is a miracle, and it's amazing, and you got to appreciate all of that. And that's like myself, to see myself where I'm at, to go from a kid that had wanted posters that my mother would lose her mind because I'll come in with ink on my clothes and I didn't have, you know, we didn't have shit, you know, stuff. And to see it now where, you know, it's you wear ink on your clothes proud and say, yeah, I'm an artist. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, it's a whole different thing. And, and also like to be in these gallery forms and have all these people that's not from our world want to hear these stories and they enjoy it and they want to, they want to witness this. They want to visualize. They want to, under, they want, you know, it's like amazing when before they didn't want to know about us. <laughs> it was like, nah, 
not. It was like a plague. It was like a disease. Like, mm -hmm. just erase them. Can the system just get rid of these people? You know, do something with them. To now, it's like, hey, you want to do this book? Hey, you want to do this interview? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, it's amazing. Look, even now, like, just to be recorded and being put into an archives because of what we've been through. Come on, that's that's amazing, man. That's like, I mean, it's a head. It bugs you out, isn't it? Because <laughs> it's like you're going from one extreme to another, to where you're an outlaw, hated, and and the problems of society. To all of a sudden now, it's like, you know, because of that, you actually are like what people need to understand, like and want to know and want to feel. It's like it's weird. It's really weird, but it's amazing, mm -hmm. and you got to look at it as that. For me. You know, look at it and see younger people transition, going in from from stuff that they would have did with oil paint and brush to now taking spray paint. And then the other, real quick, mm -hmm. that we, you take these poor kids that had nothing, we was poor, and you come up from that. You know, not having heat, not having hot water, have to sleep together, not having to share clothes or having rum, clothes handed down to you, and having to, you know, take down the, the seams from the pants from your older brothers and patches on the holes. Because and then go to school in the winter with pro kids with holes in the bottom and and, and freeze, you know, and little jackets and, and stuff to now create it to have created something that's now every element is like billion dollar industries. They have changed. Even technology has adapted to what we did, what we did. Mm -hmm. So we created, you take graffiti, for instance, or street art. We have created a multi-million dollar a year industry from different spray paints. So all the markers are now Sharpies buying them up and all these, all the old markers and inks are re-coming back. You know, um, you take break dancing, like we said, Red Bull and all these places are paying these kids hundreds of thousands, if not million dollars in sponsorship and, and Olympics now, you know, all this money, you know, the rap industry where these kids are now literally could go online and record a song and put it independently out and become millionaires overnight. You know, that were poor kids the same way with, um, what's the other one? Uh, I said DJ, DJ equipment, Serratos and all this stuff and all these digital and all these concerts you go to, all these places, all now have DJs, all these big, big um, music festivals where millions of people show up to, to, to hear somebody spin. And it's all based on what we did. So we, we went from being like, like these poor kids to fast forward. We given the world, not only culture, but economics. So I don't know, it's amazing. It is, it is. You've mentioned this individual a bit through the interview. I'd like you to elaborate on how much this individual, your brother, wow. has impacted you in the art world in your life. Uh, my brother, Can you man, name, please? Ricky Mojica. We have different fathers, so, um, but we, we didn't know our fathers, so he was raised by our mothers. So we never, ever hear us ever say a half brother, ever. That's not, doesn't even exist. Um, he's seven years older than me. Um, he's still. I'm happy he's still in my life always. Um, he, he, my brother, my brother is my everything, man. He's he's been my father figure. He's been my big brother figure. He's been he's been the one that even when I went off the road a lot in my life, because I'm the black sheep. He's been the the light of of what I could be. Uh, my brother is like, and it was hard as a young kid because I was like the one. I couldn't learn things. I had like dyslexic and I was hyper and I had all these issues. My brother was like photogenic memory. He's a genius, a genius, pure genius. Plays instruments, can sing. He's been in Starlight Express play. I mean, this guy, his story is freaking beyond natural, normal. Like, I don't think, I don't think I have, and I've read millions of people's stories and I don't think I have anybody's stories like my brother's story. So in a way, it's such a privilege. I mean, it was difficult. Because when you have something like that, you know, it's like you already know. Be like your brother, and it's impossible. Like the like his his but his influence. But because of that, on a flip end, um, it's always showed me, like no matter how bad or how low on a on a social scale we are, nothing can stop you. So my brother, from from junior high school through. Um, he would win every single award, science award, mathematics. He's just a genius, genius. But the coolest dude, but yet could fight athletic like crazy. So he's one of the founders of Zoo York. So he's kind of like also my first introduction to like what would become hip hop. 
So Zoo York was a graffiti skateboard crew with Soul Writers, it's the graffiti part with Ali and the Zephyrs and all those dudes on that side. And then you got the, the, the um, uh, um, um, Andy Kessler's and the Bopples and the Puppet Heads and him, the skateboard part. And um, they built the first ramps in the 70s in Riverside Park. And he would connect. And then the, so the fortunate, unfortunate for him, or fortunate for me, well, it's kind of unfortunate for me too, because I'll get bullied. But my moms will force him to take me wherever he would go. You know how that goes with the yeah. siblings. You know, your mom's like, Llévatelo. <laughs> si no, tu no va. <laughs> right? right? And he'll take you. But you know, you, you're going with him, but you're getting your little, <laughs> you get roughed up on the way. All his frustrations with my mom's is kicking you in your, <laughs> your ass on your way to the skateboard park. But those memories is being like a little kid, five, six, seven years old and stuff. And being around these legends, I mean, these people became to be like Andy Kessler. Forget it, man. It's like, um, it's like that's like you know you can't go higher than that, man. It's like on a skateboarding tip, you know, back then. And then also his community influence. He built the first ramps legally in Riverside Park, and now they got them in Chelsea Park. They got the House of Vans in Brooklyn. Right before he died, he had the Vans deal before he died tragically. But um, I mean, so. Even community-wise, these guys, and they were part of a generation in the 70s that wasn't my generation. Their generation was kind of like offspring off the hippies. So although they were mischievous, but they were different. Mm -hmm. My era was more brutal. As you know, we come up from the same era. We was more, it was hard. I mean, we punched each other in the chest. We it was very abusive as young people. We fought a lot. You had to fight a lot. Um, their generation was more like, they just got along, they they connected, and they would do things. And they, they liked being poor, they didn't care about it. We had the pressure of wanting to get fly, and because of that, we had to stick people up, but we also had to defend ourselves. I mean, I just sit, sat down with this kid recently, and we was talking about wearing sheepskins, you know, at junior high school, 13, 14 years old. We wear a 100 to $200 coat when people were starving out here. And we kids walking around with coats that adults don't have and are eyeing you. And you ha literally have to have your knife with you, your ice pick, and you're wearing kazals, and you're wearing sneakers that are like $50, $60 at that time, which is a lot of money people don't want, which would get you killed at that time. And you had to go out in the world. So it's not only when people see us as little kids with this fashion on, but they got to understand that not everybody could do that. Like you had to be a certain street kid to go out on the street and wear that clothes and come home alive and with it. Because if not, you was prey. Like nobody was wearing stuff like that, even adults, if they wasn't ready to defend with their lives what they had on. So it's, even with that, so if they didn't have that, like my generation. So my generation produced me who's way more vicious than him, way more aggressive, did a lot more things than he ever would have did when it comes to violence um, or had to do. But at the same time, he was a good semi-finalist, Golden Glove. He was a cat that used to, the neighborhood loved my brother too, because my brother was mad cool, but he was athletic. Him and Frosty Freeze, because um, Frosty Freeze lived across the street from me. They were actually acrobatics. Frosty Freeze, people know him from the breakdance and stuff, but prior to that, Frosty, we had our own street entertainers, as you know. Right. Every neighbor had these kids that would just, they will climbing the side of buildings, they were doing multiple flips. You had the double Dutch girls that would just and incredible like we would see the most incredible things in the ghetto in the hood like that you wouldn't people today couldn't imagine and it'll be this hot summer night and it'd just be performances going on and you go to circles and circles, there'll be boxing matches there'll be different conga stuff music going on like we had different circles of entertainment for ourselves being poor which i love that's what i miss about being poor community so my brother was one of those dudes that would go down and they would compete because you remember everything was competition and that's what made us right. great Everything from the swings, flipping off the swings. I mean, I got stories of Frosty that blows people's minds. But my brother would be one that come down the hill on the skateboard and jump over the cars and land on the skateboard and doing head stands on the skateboard and stuff like that. So on the athletic tip, he was incredible. And then he would go on to, because his two best friends, Steve and Ben, they were Golden Glove winners. We had a lot of Golden Glove winners in my neighborhood. Rico, um, Wayne Rico, 
who won. We had Michael Dominguez, who I think got four belts. He actually fought Durant. We have um, Jose Torres, I think his name was. He was the light heavyweight champion of the world. Like, all this comes out. My neighbor was incredible. Like, my neighbor had so many. And then Michael, you know, like, people like Camacho and them from the east side would come and hang out with these dudes. So you constantly see Mike Tyson would come to my neighbor all the time. Like, you constantly just, just see all this stuff, right? So my brother was one of those dudes that was highly respected in my neighborhood because of not just the athletic, but because he always pushed the envelope and it was entertaining, right? Which would follow him in life. But he he would go on and um, so just his influence as a kid, having that brother was actually not only hard on me, but it was also dope to be that your brother is like this urban superstar. Like people admire him and that's your older brother, right? But at the same time, you're not, you're nowhere near that level of, but, but I, I enjoyed it. I was proud of it as if it was me because it was my brother. So that gave me this whole, like whatever I couldn't do because he could do it was as if I could do it. You know what I mean? I don't right. know, it's hard to say, but so that, that, that's where that influence really helped me a lot. And he always went through a good path. Like he did, he did a lot of mischievous things, but never crime like me, never got into the drug trades, the gun trades, the gangs. Um, he avoided that, had everybody's respect though. Nobody messed with him, but he could fight, he could fight crazy. Just like Frosty, they had this ability of dodging, you know, like you couldn't hit these guys. These guys were amazing and they'll play with you. Like a fight for them was a game. Like it was cat and mouse. Like they they just were so skilled. Like like with me, a fight would be angry. Ah, go in there and just and get cut up and all. These guys are like, they were, they they got into the, the art of humiliating you on a fight and they loved it. Like they just loved being able. So they were top of the food chain with that. Nobody bothered them. But then he went on to school. Like I said, he would win all the awards to the last point of junior high school. They took awards away from him only because the whole three years that he was there, he was dominating all the awards that none of the kids were getting anything. So mm -hmm. the last year they had to take two awards that he won and gave it to other kids. And then he would go on to real quick. I know we're running out. Oh, we're good. Yeah. So we end up, he ended up getting going to art and design, which that he flourished there, picked up oil painting his first year under Max Ginsburg. And, and Max Greenberg, who passed away. But Max Ginsburg is a, a legend who was his predecessor to this day. Um, they still, they like this. That's his song. Um, so my brother went, picked up, he just, he basically just picked up oil painting because it was like something he had to do in there. It wasn't some of his passion. And then mastered it, became the best to where they, to this day, they still have one of his murals hanging in the cafeteria mm -hmm. of art and design, the new art and design. Even now, they still have his mural up there. So this is a person doing this like in his teens. And then he would get a, he would get scholarship offers to Yale, which he turned down. And then he took two scholarships to Parsons. And this is a poor kid coming out of tenements. So um, so he ended up getting two scholarships to Parsons, one here, because he did the four years, two in Paris overseas. So he lived overseas a couple of years on a scholarship. We'll come back, have, he never had to really work. He basically was a break dancer. So he supported himself through college, breakdance in the street, would make a couple hundred dollars a, year, uh, a week, and now be his whole, um, and he had his own apartment, but at that time the rent was cheap. And he financed himself. He went on tours for breakdancing with Levi's and Nike's. And then he eventually got into, because of his roller skating skills, he was the top skater at Roxy's. He was right. legendary at Roxy's. And he would get, he would become in Starlight Express, which was a Broadway play, which was like um, Cats, but it was on skates. And still, I think still exists overseas. He did a, a five or six year tour around the world. So he ended up traveling around the world by his twenties. He already had been around the world, completely learned three or four languages, got married a couple of times from we're overseas. And he's just incredible. He just, and then he went on to um, um, do book illustrations. Um, he did all those two elastic um, books, all the classics from the Moby Dicks to Tom Sawyer's, all the classics he did. Um, left that, end up doing romance no novels, you know, the ones with the white guys with the long hair, with the women. He ended up doing that for years and retired doing that. And um, and now he teaches at the the artist the, the Art Students League on, I think it's like 79th on the east side, 70 some street, the Artist Students League. So yeah, he's, all of that <laughs> real quick. So he's been, yeah, so he's he's been my motivation. And I, I should say through, everything positive in my life, as well as some 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 stuff he did to me when I was younger, <laughs> but I let it go. <laughs> All right.
So to close out, what does the Bronx mean to you? Oh man, the Bronx is 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 a, is is everything because, like I said, from my neighborhood, we only have a little bridge that separates us. I spent a lot of time in the Bronx as well, but the Bronx influenced like our neighborhood tremendously, especially when it came to culture, um, and because we had so much similarities from the burnt down stuff. And again, like I said, Harlem. Even when you listen to the Black Spades documentary, they talk about their chapters was in South Bronx, but also in Harlem. So it was never, like we never had, when it comes to the other boroughs, because Brooklyn and Queens are never so far away, the Bronx and, and Manhattan was never, especially uptown, was never really divided like that. We would say uptown. Uptown made, made it was all in one. Like we said uptown, it meant north of 96th Street, up, like all oh, the 90s, up. And into the Bronx, so it was never. I caught cases, like I said here, in Jackson Avenue. Um, but early, early on, we used to come to the Bronx River for the jams, the Zulu jams, early hip hop. And we in junior high school, we would have to fight our way, you know, from the train station. We were kids, we coming from a hat with sheepskins, and and we coming to these breakdancing, you know, and these hip hop parties. You know, this is prior for it becoming, you know, outside of the community. But this is when it's still ghetto, right? And we going through. You know, going to the Bronx River and being a part of Zulu. I've been a part of Zulu since I was a little kid. I can't even tell you. Like as long, probably as long as I've been in Familia. So Zulu's always been a part of us. The Bronx has always been a part. And then later on, even with the Panthers, I did a lot of my work at the Point, in Hunts Point, um, the community center called the Point. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our work was done up here. So I think my relationship with the Bronx has always been. Um, I don't see a difference really to a separation. Like I said, it's just. A little bridge on 100, I think it's 135th Street, and it takes like maybe five to seven minutes to cross it. You know, South Bronx. <laughs> so it's like it's like it's not that far. It's like to us, it's not it's not a separated borough. It's like I feel like we're an extension in a way when it comes to you know my 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 wife, my ex wife is from Fordham Road and University. So okay, that even shows you I married a Bronx girl. So, all right. <laughs> so, <laughs> send one. I want to tell you thank you. This has been a great oral history. Oh, man. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>